We talked a lot about last week. You know, we're working through this journey, the heart of worship. And the first two weeks, it seemed like the Lord very clearly led us to talk about honesty. That before we can even worship God, we need to get honest with God. And it's actually from the place of honesty that we're able to learn how to even begin to worship Him. And there's this interesting thing that I've learned in the place of honesty. Um, it's interesting because even today as we were worshiping, it felt, it felt very mountaintop to me. It felt very, um, it, you know, celebrative and exciting and it was good, you know. Sometimes the Lord will lead us there. Sometimes we feel like we're in the valley or we're pressing in and it feels harder. But I've learned this, is that when I get honest with the Lord, something starts to happen to me. Sadness can sometimes enter in or hopelessness or despair. And it feels very puzzling in the moment, especially as a Christian at times. You know, a Christian that's supposed to be joy-filled, a Christian that's experienced the salvation, deliverance from their sin. Anyone else know what I'm talking about? And, and I think what becomes difficult at times is that when hard things happen to Christians, we freak out a bit because we think this isn't supposed to happen to me. And God forbid I let anybody else know because then they might question if I'm even a real Christian. Is that making sense? Here's the thing that I've learned about the leadership of the Holy Spirit is that He actually at times, not every time, and so this message might make sense for some and for others you might not find yourself in this season. Or you've run, you've run from this season as I'm about to share how I used to. But there's a season of disorientation that we can experience at times at times. Excuse me. Why is that? Why do we begin to experience spiritual disorientation or confusion or even as some would say, and we talked about this last week, the dark night of the soul. Why? Because God is that jealous for your heart that he loves you that much. The word says that when we draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. Here's what happens, and this is what is so cool about the Lord, is that when we get honest, it's us saying, God, I want to draw near to you. And then we get scared because He draws near to us and everything changes. When the Lord draws near to you, the lights turn on. And all of a sudden, you see the impurities that are in your heart. Lord, I didn't know that I was dealing with these childhood wounds. I didn't realize that this was a traumatic event that I experienced until the emotion started to rise. I didn't know that I was still hurt or offended or all these things. And God, the good shepherd in his love is saying, you want me to draw near? I'm going to draw near, but when I get close to you, you don't stay the same. Everything changes. There's a holiness to who God is. I remember when I was in college and I went to this worship night and I felt like things started to change inside of me. I started to experience what I would consider in my life at that time a spiritual awakening. And I became addicted in some ways to worship. I loved worship. I loved it. I loved it until one time I was at a worship night and I was confused. Because as I was in this deep place of excited worship with the Lord and with my fellow classmates and peers and everybody together in unity, these old feelings and these fears and these wounds started to creep in. And I was confused. And so I did what any other probably early Christian would do. I started to go to every event I could go to to distract myself. Because I thought, the devil's trying to get me. He's trying to rob my joy. He's trying to trip me. He's trying to take me down. And I'm going to keep worshiping you, Lord. And then I remember one faithful day, I was in the Word... Then I was reading, and then the Lord, I just felt like he just whispered to me. And he said, Luke, it's, it's been me all along. It's not Satan. It's not the devil. It doesn't mean he won't come to try and kill, steal, and destroy, right? We understand that. But there's a difference when the Lord in his love, his jealous love, is saying, I want all of you, not just the good. I want the ugly. I want the dark. I want the things that are still unsettled. And this was the beginning journey. I'm still deep in this journey of still trying to learn these seasons of disorientation. When they happen, 
why they happen, how they happen. But what I know about the Lord as a good shepherd is that He loves you enough that He wants all of it. And so I want to tell you that if you're in your own spiritual journey taking steps to get honest, do not be surprised if these things begin to come up. Do not be surprised because it's the faithfulness of God pursuing your heart. That as you have drawn near to the Lord, He is drawing near to you. And He wants to deal with the things that maybe you've tried to deny, maybe you've tried to reject, maybe you've tried to run from. And even today, as I, I believe this, that as we're opening this teaching up, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation and His Spirit lives inside of you. It's time that as Christians, we start to learn how to engage with His Spirit. And we start to minister to His presence. And we start to trust His presence. And we start to grow in His presence. Amen? Amen. I want to talk about a man that I think experienced a lot with the Lord. Jordan actually a few weeks ago talked about King David. And he talked about the story of King David and how he fell into an adulterous sin with Bathsheba. And then he expounded beautifully on Psalm 51, the psalm that David wrote in this place of sin. And we got to see the beauty of a journey of a man that recognized his wrong and did something about it by inviting God in. But I want us to just backtrack a little bit before we get to that. And I want to actually give you guys a quick journey into the life of David because I love you, I've accompanied some of my personal art along with this journey. So get the popcorn ready. Oh boy, here we go. So we begin this story with David, who was just a low shepherd boy. In fact, scholars believe that he was likely around um, 8 to 10 years old when David was a shepherd boy. They start him young because he had so many brothers. And his father, Jesse, said, hey, you're the youngest, so you get the hard duty. You've got to go be in a field isolated from everybody, and you can talk to sheep, and you, know, you take care of them. But I believe that it was actually in the shepherding fields that David discovered something with God called intimacy. That when David was alone in the wilderness, he learned who his heavenly father was. Not long after that, they believe that David, David was 10 to 12 years old when he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. God said that I'm going to have a new king and he would speak through his prophets at the time. And so God spoke to the prophet Samuel. I'm going to try and <laughs> work through this. I hope this is helpful to you. Some enjoyment here, some entertainment. And so David gets anointed by the prophet Samuel. It's a crazy story because David has so many brothers. And it's awkward because Jesse's like, you want to see my sons? Great. Here's all my presentable best sons. Here they are available to you. It's like a, a, an arranged wedding or something going on. He's like, yes, here they are. And Samuel's like, this is awkward, God. Like, are you sure it's none of these guys? Because he's saying these are his sons. And what's really crazy is that David must have been in, in sight because then Jesse goes, well, I have one more son. He's right over there. And David's just like, hey, I talk to sheep, you know. Well, David gets anointed to be the next king. And you guys know the story. One of David's greatest feats is that he defeats the giant Goliath, the, the, um, the villain of the story who's defiling God and all of his people. And David, in his fury of jealousy and zeal for the Lord, says, you will not speak ill of my... Man, I'm trying to be very serious, and this is very hard right now. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking through this. But I think David learned a lot about faith in that day. Because can you imagine a wee little lad that's coming before a mammoth of a man where the entire army is afraid and shaking in their boots. And David would say, don't give me the king's armor. I'm going in faith today. And I'm going with what I know. I could preach a whole sermon on that. I mean, let's be honest. And how many of you know that it was by faith that David slung that rock and slayed Goliath? He learned about faith that day. David gets promoted to be the commander of the king's army. And he does a good job there were songs written about him that he slayed more than the king. And all of a sudden, the reputation of David is going to celebrity status. Every woman wants a shot with him. Every man wants to be like him, except for one, the mad king, King Saul, who becomes obsessed with 
rage to kill David. And this becomes a new journey for David in his life with God. That David has no choice but to flee the kingdom of Israel. Imagine that, that you believe that the prophet who hears from God anointed you and said you're going to be the next king and then you're being fled out of the kingdom by the mad king. I wonder how many of us need to just read the story of David to practice patience in the journey of what God might be speaking to us. David learned about the steadfastness of God. That when everybody, and I mean just about everybody, abandoned David, everybody wanted his autograph, now everybody wanted to figure out where he was to get the ransom and the reward, and now he has none but a few. And one of those few is the same God that he developed intimacy with in the shepherding fields. It's not much different. He's back in this lonely, uh, isolated place, but he learned about the steadfastness of the good father. Well, Saul eventually dies in battle, and David, at the age of 30, now remember, at the age of 10 to 12, he was anointed to be the next king. Imagine waiting that long, fleeing for your life and so many things. But at the age of 30, David learned about the fulfillment of God's words, that God, if he says it, he's going to do it. Amen? And so at the age of 30, David becomes the king of Israel, and five years after that, he conquers Jerusalem, which would become the holy city. And boy, does God have plans for Jerusalem that get me excited. And so I want to tell you guys the story about David as he's conquered Jerusalem. He's conquered his enemies, and he's excited because God, at this point in Israel's journey and in their history, he, he has provided the symbol of his presence in something known as the Ark of the Covenant. It was this beautiful tapestry of a box that represented the presence of God. In many ways, it was the presence of God. And wherever Israel had the Ark of the Covenant, whenever they had the presence of God with them, blessing always followed. They were in a battle, and the Ark of the Covenant was on their side. They always won. And we're going to learn a little bit later how there was a blessing that came with that. And so here's where we pick up in the story. This is 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you have your Bibles. It will also be on the screen. And just a few verses here. This is verse 3. It says that they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel, think about how many people that must have been, were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. I like to think that in this story, if it was us, we'd have like some combination of Robbie and Kelsey and Angie just leading on their cajones, trumpets going, probably Natalie somewhere, you know, playing in the background, and uh, everybody else, because you guys are awesome. (laughs) But it's a big production, to say the least. I mean, think about this. A couple more pictures for you guys. There's a new cart, and so, you know, David's like, hey, we're not riding the Prius anymore. Now, we're going we're gonna to ride in a Bentley. Like, we got to make it stylish. That's what the Bible says, that the ark was on a new cart. So they got some fashion to them. Can I tell you what also stood out to me? See, so many of us, we understand what comes of this story. That David danced before the Lord with all of his might, and he would become even more undignified than this. And we're going to talk about that next week. But it's interesting to me that even in this, David and all of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might. They're celebrating. But we don't talk about the first time. Why? I'm going to break that down a bit. There's also this musical production. You know, I think about Aladdin. You know that moment where he's rolling on Abu, his monkey, who's now an elephant, and you got all these guys with their trumpets, and it's like Prince uh, Lee. You know, I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but hopefully you're there with me. It's a big production. And the point is, i got to get the attention of Jasmine. i got to let her know that there's a new man on the market. i got my hair done. i got a new outfit on. You know, all these kind of things. Well, this is kind of what this reminds me of. I mean, it's a big production. Every instrument you need, it's there. All the people. you got the king dancing with all his might. you got the Ark of the Covenant rolling in style on a new cart. What could go wrong? Why did I have to ask that? 
Well, if you guys know the story, there's an oxen that stumbles and poor Uzzah, he just thinks, well, I've got reflexes. I mean, how many of us do this? I mean, every time I open the food pantry and something falls out, I catch the peanut butter. And I'm like, you know, I'm testing the old Spider-Man thing out. Like, dang it, man, maybe next time. But it, it happened. I'm just saying, like, or the second thing is like, did anybody see that? Bailey? No? My dog? Darn it. I'm going to just start filming. No, I'm not. I'm not that. But anyways, poor Uzza. I mean, what does he do wrong? Not much. Well, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. But his reflex is he thinks I'm going to stabilize the ark or the oxen so the ark does not fall and I'm going to catch it. But by touching the ark of the covenant in a moment, I don't even really know what happens, but he's not alive anymore. He's no longer with the people in the moment. I mean, he's dead. He experienced the glory of God in the wrong way. And in a moment, him, and we think, I don't get it. He did something so innocently. But I want to talk more about this. Because if we don't understand the context, we just think, I don't want to serve that God. In fact, I think sometimes mysterious things happen and we think, Lord, are you really a God of love? Are you really a good God? Man, especially in this day and age. I mean, how many people do we know that have even maybe grown up in the faith and they've fallen away? But beloved, I'm telling you, don't be too quick to judge the actions of the imperfect people who worship a perfect God. Or how about an imperfect pastor who's just trying? Please don't let my leadership become the standard of who God is. Do you understand what I'm saying? we got to be so careful with these things. How many times... Do I realize, like, Lord, forgive me because I forgot who you were? Well, David, in this moment, full of fear, the word says, he chose not to take the ark into Jerusalem. Think about who David is. A lot of history. We just talked about it. David's a friend of God. He's a man after his own heart. He knows him well. He's been through so many experiences. And at this point, he's in a good place with the Lord. and He thinks, I want my best friend there with me. Something happens here that I don't think we talk enough about because it's awkward. I mean, what did the instruments do at that point? What, ha- what did the people do at that point? I mean, I want to take a sensitivity to a man's life that was lost in this moment. I can't imagine the distraught that came over David because this is a scene. The new cart, the production, David's already dancing. He's excited and all of a sudden, I mean, I imagine it's just so silent. Nobody knows what to do. David, full of fear, chose not to take the ark into Jerusalem. See, I believe that the word says that for three months, David would wait until the Lord, or until he would bring the ark back into Israel, into Jerusalem. And I wonder what those three months must have been like. Because I can't imagine they were good. I mean, I can't imagine that David was just thinking, it's okay. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord, man, we're going to have a good day. No, I think that David was distraught. I think David was confused. I think David was angry. I know he was afraid, as the word says. Sometimes when we find ourselves in disorientation, we need to not hurry the way out of it. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. See, I believe that for three months, David, as he was apart from God's presence, was in a season of spiritual disorientation. And I want to invite you guys to really consider, because I want you to learn today what this season is like so that you can discern if you're in it or if you fall into it and what we do when we find ourselves in it. Spiritual disorientation can be hard to define and sometimes you don't even realize you've experienced it until you've gone through it. It's a season of complete and utter confusion. Not as much confusion, but misunderstanding. A confusion that can deal with uncertainty. An uncertainty which often begins with you and it can affect everything around you. Your life, your friends, your God. It can convince you of certain lies such as not belonging, not being wanted, or simply that you're better off alone. Oh, I tell you, Satan loves if he can get you alone. He's been doing it since the beginning. Spiritual disorientation can make you feel like a prisoner in your own mind, and it can cause you to question everything you thought you once knew. A group in the faith, I don't understand. This isn't who God is. This isn't who I'm supposed to be. And all while the Good Shepherd is just saying, 
Stay in this. It will convince you of lies such as regression, that you should just give up because you'll never move forward, that you've done something wrong or you're more sinful than ever. Can I just say very quickly that I see that a lot in people that are new in the Lord and they start to, you know, the first few months, they're good. Everything's great. They're alive and alert in worship. They're at a lot of community events. And then you start to see less of them. And when I check in on them, they're like, oh, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. I'm ashamed of myself. I'm like, no, you're just, you're, you're becoming more holy is what's happening. God and his love is revealing to you what he wants to purify. And God doesn't reveal to steal. He reveals to heal. I'm going to talk more about that. You're not more sinful than ever, but it will convince you of that. It produces weariness and lack of motivation. And the lies, they're so easy to believe. God has abandoned me. God is disproved of me, disappointed in me, or even God isn't real. It was just my emotions. It was just the crazy people I was friends with. Just like David, we too can experience spiritual disorientation. It can come in various seasons. Sometimes it's situational. Sometimes it's unexpected. Sometimes it's actually God and His love wanting to purge things from your life. Sometimes when we get sick, we experience it. Because what happens when we get sick? Well, we're stuck, aren't we? We do the same thing over and over again. We're either binge-watching Love is Blind or The Bachelor or um, football. Anybody? Come on, I'm trying to get my audience here. <laughs> um, we're away from people. We're stuck usually in the same room for long periods of time. And how hard is it to transition back into normal life when we've been captive in isolated life? We get extremely busy in seasons of life. Maybe work got really busy. I know for some of us in our different jobs, there can be seasons where it's really low and simple and seasons where it seems like there's no rest for the weary. Or schoolwork, students, seminary students, right? Like college students, we experience the upheaval of work. Everybody knows when finals are coming, you start doing the Hail Marys and you're praying a little bit more. You're not fasting, you're just forgetting to eat. But you call it fasting, right? I'm just kidding. You're like, Lord, please accept this offering. Hear my prayers. I've been there too much. Or stressful moments that arise when you're raising a family. You think, let's just have one more kid. What were we thinking? We just got outnumbered all of a sudden, right? And that happens. And we can start to believe all these lies that we're not enough, that we're a terrible parent, that God is displeased with us, and spiritual disorientation starts to step in. Struggling with sin patterns in life, that can be a massive move of spiritual disorientation. Can I tell you that often when I struggle with an addiction to lust, oftentimes after falling to that addiction, I always felt like an orphan. I don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I belong. I don't even know if I know who I am. Because why do I keep doing this? That's just my own personal confession to you. Years ago, God and His love redeemed me, renewed me, but can I tell you it started when I got honest with myself. Yeah. Or, and there's many more than this, I'm sure, but sadly we experience tragedy or a traumatic event that can stop us dead in our tracks. I think David, this might have been his. I mean, he knew this guy. He was a friend to him. He was helping him with the procession of the Ark of the Covenant. That's his friend. Trauma sets in in a moment. And so this and many other ways we experience a season. Yes, a season. There are ways out of it. We're going to talk about that because of him, not us, of spiritual disorientation. Here's my first point. When you find yourself in a season of spiritual disorientation, when you feel stuck, wait on the Lord. Yeah. When you feel stuck, good. Don't try to do anything. Yeah. Stop trying to do so much. Wait on the Lord. We live in a world today that is so quick to cover up. I'm just going to put makeup on. Um, when someone passes away, we try every way to make them look living, even knowing they're dead. We live in a culture that is extremely uncomfortable with the idea of sorrow and hardship. And so what we do is we try to distract ourselves as fast as we can. And all the while, the Lord as a shepherd 
is saying, if you would just wait on me, on my voice, on my word, on my comfort. I want to encourage you to embrace the season of life that you might find yourself into and invite the Lord into it. There's a man named Bruce Demarest. I'm going to quote him pretty often throughout this sermon. He wrote this book, Seasons of the Soul. Fantastic read. And he did a deep study as a theologian, as a teacher, as a writer, an author, on the Christian life. It needs to start learning how to um, mourn. It needs to learn how to lament. Christians need to learn that it's okay to not be okay. This was much of his life study. Passed away just a few years ago, but an amazing contribution to the body of Christ. And he says this, the compassionate Father perfectly knows our struggles and afflictions. That's good news. And we can be confident that He is with us in our trials, even if our sense of His presence occasionally burns dim. It's okay. Jesus is not only with us in our trials, but as our great high priest, he actually enters into our afflictions. I hope this is water to your soul right now. This is good news. The greater we suffer, the greater his compassionate heart showers us with mercy and goodness. What I love about what Damaris is getting at is he's saying he already knows. He's a good father. You know, think about that. You guys have heard me say this so many times, but I, I love going back to the garden because we learned so much about sin and brokenness and God in the garden. And God in His love is walking in the cool of the day. Where are you? Can I tell you that He 99.999% knew where they were? You know when you're playing hide and seek with a little kid and you're like, where are you? That's what I think happened. Really, guys? Behind the bushes? Fifth row back? Second chair? Who's that for? He already knows. He already knows. But in his love, he's waiting on you. In his love, he's waiting on you to let him into these vulnerable places. So we're going to break that down more practically. Here's my second point. See, in intentional waiting comes directional healing. That when we intentionally wait, do you know what? Let me just break that down for you. Intentional, we're choosing to press into this season and not bypass it or run from it. There's intentionality. It takes intentionality to wait on the Lord. Can I tell you that waiting on the Lord's not scrolling on your Instagram feed? Well, I'm waiting. It's not just watching that show or that news channel or sitting in your living room. It's, it's, there's intentionality to it. There's a positioning. There's a posturing. I'm going to talk more about that. Directional. Here's the thing I love about the Holy Spirit. He loves you enough that He wants to do it with you. Not for you, with you. Yeah. Sanctification, He wants to do it with you. And as you wait on the Lord, He's going to directly start bringing things up that He's already seen in your heart that He wants to heal. That's why worship is so important. Because as we're getting honest, the Lord is walking in the room and He starts to touch us. And He starts to reveal it to us. And He's putting out a hand and He's saying, if you want me to heal this, I will, but you have to let me in. There is this ancient prayer tradition called an examine that monasteries founded. And what they would do is it would be a devotional exercise involving reflection and a moral evaluation of one's thoughts and conduct typically performed on a daily basis. This prayer exam is what they called it. And what is happening is they're just creating dialogue with the Lord. And I want to give you guys the tools on how you can practice a prayer exam in any season really, but especially a season of spiritual disorientation. First, take two min minutes, if not longer. For me, it's longer. I, I started with two and it was really good at a time, but I started to grow more and more. Truthfully, I just become more distracted and I'm more aware of my distracted mind, so I gotta take a little bit longer. But for starters, take two minutes of stillness and silence. Fight the resistance of distraction of retreat or retreat. As hidden feelings rise to the surface, don't fear them, embrace them. It's God. He's rising things in you. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Well, I'm going to renew you, but I have got to get honest with you first. So he's bringing things up. I love how the great St. Augustine, he says, Do not go abroad. Return with yourself. In the inward man or woman swells truth. 
As we wait on the Lord, don't run. Don't distract. Don't divide. Stay devoted. Wait on the Lord. And as Augustine's saying, the inward man, the inner things, deep begins to cry out to deep. And God is loving that place of dialogue. And He's going to bring things up. Truth is going to begin to swell up within you. Number two, journal what you're feeling or experiencing. Can I tell you that even the simple act of writing can be healing? I'm not much of a journal writer. I don't, I'm not good at journals. Oftentimes I open my journal up and I'm lucky if I realize, man, it's been a month. But it doesn't mean you don't stop trying. It doesn't mean you don't stop going for it. And intentional silence, we want to hear from the Lord and just write. And if you don't feel like you're hearing anything, just write how you're feeling. Get honest with yourself. Time and time again, I've learned that when I just write what I'm feeling, the Lord begins to engage with my spirit. It's amazing. And if you don't know, just try it. Number three, underline what you think you need to surrender. As you've written these honest feelings, underline the things like, Lord, I think this, I'm, right. I'm underlining in faith right now. Maybe this is something that you need to let go of. Maybe this is something you need to receive forgiveness for or forgive another for. Let's talk about some reconciliation here. Lord, is there anything in my heart that I need to let go of? I need to forgive. And trust the Spirit leading you. Don't overthink it. We are more spiritual than we realize. It's because of Him, not us, by the way. He has created us to be spiritual beings. We are temples of God. If you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you. So trust Him when He starts to dialogue with you. Amen? Amen. Lastly, pray out loud. Yes, I said it. Out loud. I don't care if you're alone in the room. If you live alone, pray out loud. A prayer of surrender. Because you're declaring it to yourself. You're declaring it to the principalities and powers that have tried to take you down. And you're declaring it to the heavens. I'm free. I'm confessing this. I'm letting go of this. And because I'm letting go, there's space to receive something better. Converse with the Lord. Jordan said it. Pray without ceasing. We talked about that weeks ago in Thessalonians. It's not that complicated. It's just talking to God. Conversing with God. And then journal in faith anything you might sense from the Lord. I love doing this practice with small groups. I've done it before. And it's so funny because people are like, I can't hear from the Lord. I can't hear from the Lord. And it's so funny because at the end of it, when we're writing what we think we heard from the Lord, those dang people that said they can't hear from the Lord are writing the most prophetic things I've heard. I'm like, you don't hear from the Lord, but that is so from the Lord. Isn't that interesting? And it's amazing. They don't even know it after they write it, but once they start reading out loud to their group, and you should see the shock on their face, and they kind of look up at everybody and a smile starts to form because they're learning that they do hear from God. But remember, you hear from him when you listen for him, and you listen when you're quiet. So that's what we do. A prayer examine. And I want to encourage you guys. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We are more than conquerors. We can be in dark seasons and have beautiful intimacy with God. Damaris says this, that I've discovered that when I travel inward, without, of course, becoming self-absorbed, that's important too, I experience a double blessing. First, I acquire self-knowledge, the truth about myself, and self-understanding, the awareness of my credits and deficits. deficits. In other words, the things that are good about me, but the things that aren't so good about me, the things I need to be purified. And he says this, that I discover more of who I really am and ultimately find my true identity in Jesus Christ. Secondly, I connect with Christ who dwells at the center of my being. Jesus lives in us and patiently waits for our hearts to cling to His. Praise God. Yeah. Worship team, if you guys want to play for me. Damaris says this, and I want to break this down. Travel inward. What does that mean? Augustine said it. The inward man swells truth. What are they talking about? It means that we're facing ourselves in the quiet and becoming aware of God's presence in this place. I'm going to say that again. We're facing ourselves in the quiet. It takes courage. It takes bravery. You're facing demons. Not just, I'm not just using that expression in the way that we do it in America. You're facing the demonic. You are facing things 
that you have come into wrong places of agreement with and they don't want to give back the freedom they took from you. It takes courage. It takes courage to face those things, but I want to remind you that you're not alone in it. God is faithful and He's with us in these places. And so we're facing ourselves in the quiet and we're becoming aware of God's presence in this place. He tells us this in his quote, that when we get brave and honest, we discover more of the truth of who we are, but better, who Christ is in this place. And I want to remind you, because we are not about worshiping ourselves. Getting quiet or learning more about yourself is not about you. It's about discovering who's got, who God has created you to be. Augustine would make this prayer, Lord, help me to know myself better that I may know you better. Yeah. It's in the place of getting honest that we experience this love. Yeah. I'm going to close with this quote by Demarest. Because everything we just talked about, I know it's not easy. I'm aware of that. I told you this last week. I'll tell you it again that many theologians Consider a lot of what this season is. A, a season of spiritual disorientation is the dark night of the soul. Damaris says this, that the turmoil of the dark night, or in this case, spiritual disorientation, it can pose a threat if we fail to respond properly. Heed these words, please. It can pose a threat if we fail to respond properly. Overcome with confusion, we might conclude that God is not there for us. That God has not come to our aid in our time of dire need. We may be tempted to flee the darkness, rail at God, drop out of the church, or seek worldly ple pre uh, pleasures to fill our emptiness. This is what we're talking about. We started this sermon, right? We were talking about it's easy to hide. It's easy to run, but can I tell you, it will not get you anywhere. The only way out is through with Him. Rather than resist downward, or excuse me, rather than resist downward, rather than to suppress and to run and resist, we have got to learn how to persist onward. It's my final point. Stop retreating and start receiving. Stop retreating and start receiving. Beloved, we have so many options of retreat. So easy. We live in a world of a digital age. It is so easy. I know this, you know this, it gets us nowhere. When he is bringing things up, I said this, God, he does not reveal to steal, but to heal. God does not reveal to punish, he reveals to purify. There's things in you that he is a jealous and loving God and he wants to purify you. You come into worship, and you think, I just want a good experience. And he says, I just want your heart. We're not talking about experiences. Believe me, there is joy evermore. Pleasure never ending. This is who he is. He, you were created by him, and you were created for him, and you can only be fulfilled in him. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. But it starts with us going, Lord, here I am. Here's my honesty. Here's my brokenness. And can I tell you that the voice of the good father is just where are you? Where are you? I just want to be with you. These are not yours to carry any longer. He's not a religious tyrant. He's a loving father. And he wants all of your heart. He wants to heal you from the inside out. He wants you to be the best version of yourself. And whatever you've experienced, trauma, negativity, curses, downfall, self-sabotage, whatever it is, I'm telling you today, there is new mercy available to you. Not because we're a church. Because He is on the throne in heaven. Let's pray together.